Hello, and welcome to another online meeting hosted by Sobriety Engine. All are welcome in our meetings, and we thank you for joining us. Sobriety Engine is an online platform that provides meetings and resources to people struggling with drug or alcohol addiction. Sobriety Engine is not a 12-step fellowship. However, all 12-step fellowships are welcome in our meetings. We understand that many of us who attend online meetings will have a recovery background in a 12-step fellowship. For that reason, we welcome you to share about sponsorship, the 12 steps, your experience with spiritual principles, and any lessons you may have learned in the big book, the simple text, or any other 12-step literature. Sobriety Engine is also accepting of other recovery-related programs. Your program is your program. We support you and appreciate you being here. If you feel compelled to introduce yourself as an alcoholic or an addict, please do so. However, this is not a requirement to speak or share at our meetings. Maybe this digital meeting is your first taste of recovery. If so, we hope you come here with an open mind and willingness to listen to others. Sobriety Engine also accepts and welcomes people from all walks of life. Regardless of your skin color, your belief systems, your gender, or your sexual identity, you are welcome in our online meetings. Finally, we ask that you come into our meetings with an open mind about spiritual principles. Many of us are clean and sober today because of the spiritual principles we have founded our lives on. No one will push their beliefs on you. We will only welcome you with open arms. Some simple rules for us to follow today. Uh, this will be a speaker meeting. The host will introduce a speaker and allow time for the speaker to share their story. During the share, I ask all members to please keep their microphones muted. When the speaker is done sharing, the meeting will be open to offer support, encouragement, any pressing matters members may be experiencing or general questions for the guest speaker. It will be the host's responsibility to call on the members of the community and moderate shares. Please be sure to limit your shares to three minutes. Please keep your audio on mute unless you are speaking. Please make sure you, you, all your shares are respectful. If your camera is on, please be sure you are clothed with your camera pointed towards your face and you are being respectful. If you're looking to have a private conversation with someone, please do so in the chat of Sobriety Engine. Thank you and enjoy the meeting. Uh, hello everyone and thank you for being here today. My name is Travis. I will be the meeting host. I'm grateful for all of you to share your time with us on this beautiful Saturday. Today our speaker will be Geraldine. I asked her to come up with two words that she believes would describe her journey and recovery. She said that strength and worthiness represents her story. And so I took some time to find these suitable words for her. There is a wholeness that is already mine. It's already ours. I am not just the seed. I am the rain that waters the flower. It's a reality that's already there that I am enough. I take on faith that wholeness is already mine, that I need do nothing to deserve, that my worthiness is based only on my being. I am wise enough to let go and I'm strong enough to remember the truth of who I really am. I can encounter the world in such a way that I remember who I am. I am the rest inside the unrest. I am the depth of the sky and the light piercing the sea. I am the crest of a wave, all that I need to be, I am. There is no problem to solve in this moment. There is no plan to make, no failure to be feared, no other place to be. This moment is enough. This place is enough. This imperfection is enough. I am patient enough for my life to unfold in divine timing. I feel the fullness of my life in this moment. I feel the richness of my life in this space. I am loved beyond thought and I have nothing to prove. There is no one to impress. I receive the message that being is enough. I am wise enough to see magic through a child's eyes I am resilient enough to see past the pain. I am kind to realize that my worth has been with me this whole time. Beyond the shadows that I have created, the message remains, I am the same. I have always been enough, simply by being here, simply by being. It only takes a moment and I remember this again. And so when I think of what strength and worthiness means to me, think, you know, like the poem says, it's always been a part of who I am. And when I was in addiction, I lacked these traits and I felt depleted often. Um, the journey of recovery is to me about being strong in many ways that I previously chose not to be strong. 
and oftentimes I decided my worth by the value of what I was willing to pay for drugs and or alcohol. I was not strong in my addiction and I had very little self-worth. I had to remind myself often that I am strong enough to be worthy of my recovery and that all I need is within myself. And without further ado, Geraldine, please share with us your story. Wow, you just said, hit the nail on the head. I have to, I don't need to say anything. That was beautiful. Thank you, Travis. Hi, friends, Geraldine Alcoholic. I see we're an intimate group here. Um, you know, I was thinking this morning, it's like, God, I feel like they've heard my story, but us alcoholics, we've got stories, you know, and um, where I was and what happened and where I am now. Uh, I um, come from a divorced family and um, when I was 11, I couldn't, um, in those days you couldn't, you didn't tell anybody, everything was under the rug and you walk into the lion's den. Um, it's funny because some of my friends didn't even know I come from a divorced family through high school. And um, I was one of the first where our parents got divorced and it was just really weird. And my friends, I still have from kindergarten, a lot of their families are still married. But anyways, um, when my parents separated and got divorced, this little girl, I was lost. And it's not that, you know, I had a, a good upbringing, you know, they did the best they could. They had me when they were 17 and 18. My mom didn't ever have a job or a license. My dad, um, he always provided. And um, when they got divorced, um, I ended up going with him and he had a heavy hand. And, you know, I always got um, minimized, you know, like when I would tell my mom, yeah, dad hit me, he did this, he did it. Oh, Geraldine, you know, they would minimize what happened and they didn't even live there. They weren't behind closed doors. So anyways, um, enough was enough. My mom finally did pick me up when I was 14 um, after cheerleading. And um, I went to live with her. She got a job and she worked graveyard and it was on. You know, she left at 10 at night. The, she'd come home and the house would be cleaner from when she left because we'd have everyone over. And um, I could say that out loud now. And, you know, my mom, uh, when we'd say, mom, did you know? Because I knew, you know, I knew. Yeah, our parents know. But anyways, um, you know, high school, I was okay. I was a mediocre student. You know, I, I like to run with the, the crowd. We, we had a little group called the pink ladies and my nickname surprisingly was faith go figure. And, um, we all are still friends. They were always supportive with me and my sobriety. Um, I first found First of all, I never even knew of AA. I, I never heard of it. I just know that my family drank a lot. Like if the, the parties would get together, they were drunk, they get drunk and they'd fight. I mean, I've seen it all. My grandma would have to give us teaspoons of sugar to calm us down, you know, and I was the first to be born of all the grandchildren. So I felt like it was my duty to take care of the cousins while the adults fought. And um, I always hold, held that on me. I don't know why, but uh, it, they were ugly fights. Guns would come out, you know, you guys, it was just like ugly. And so um, that was my upbringing. And um, like I said, I never heard of AA or knew of alcoholics, not, didn't even know about an alcoholic, go figure. Talk about denial, but I, um, Found the rooms in 2004. I didn't get sober until 2008. I didn't have a sober day until I was 33 to 43. So this was all from 2004, 2008. And no, I don't have all that time under my belt. Now my part of my story is relapsing. But as um, I have a sister, I have a half sister. Um, we weren't close growing up. And my half sister and I aren't close. Uh, she, of course, with my dad's new, um, I mean, his marriage. But anyways, um, where was I going with this? 
Um, oh, I have a sister and um, I have a son that I had at 20 years old, married out of what, uh, I mean, no marriage. His father is still a part of his life. I'm still a part of his life. We, of course, um, he's 35. We still have holidays together. It's killing me with this pandemic because I haven't seen my son. I just want to touch him and kiss him. But um, I love him. Uh, so anyways, my, my drinking was just, you guys, we all kind of have a similar story. I mean, I, I craved my dad's attention really bad. I was, got myself into a really abusive relationship from when I was 14 to 28 very abusive. My family doesn't know, but my friends have picked me up bleeding and everything. But, um, and he was an alcoholic, but in between that 14 years, I did get pregnant with Brandon, who's my son's father, Donnie, who um, I thank God. I know that sounds a little trashy, but it was meant to be because at 23, I was in a car accident, which, um, um, I was in a car accident and, um, you know, I, my head was banged up. They put, I don't even know how many stitches in my head. They sent me home. I go, no, my stomach hurts. My stomach hurts. I think that happened like four times. He sent me away. And then my mom, um, I kind of remember her calling the hospitals and, um, she took me to a different hospital. And by the time she got me there, I was code blue pronounced dead parentinitis. If no one knows what that is, that's when your bowels erupt. And I went into cardiac arrest. The bowels erupt and the poison goes through your body. Um, if you look it up, uh, there's not a chance that you really live through parentinitis. Uh, I'm a survivor. And um, I didn't know that then. You know, at 23, I was told I couldn't have any more kids. My son is the only son, but you know, that's how God works. Look at the, what I just told you. I was in an abusive relationship, but I cheated on him with the right guy. I mean, I, I knew Donnie, his dad, and we grew up and, you know, I loved his family. They loved me, but um, my son is just not, not a part of that abusive relationship. But, and then, you know, so when I was 23, it was my accident. I had to learn how to walk, talk, and um, they left the trach in too long. And as you guys know here, there's only, you guys know my story about me can't swallowing and needed procedures. And I was told January 29th, the last time they cut me open, surgery, they told me I have to do this for the rest of my life. So then again, there was another thing. And here I am 56. I've been going through this since I was 23. And I used to drink over it. And um, I used to drink over the fact that my dad didn't know. The fact, you know, I just shit I used to drink over. But um, I, I have PTSD in, um, from the accident. I don't drive, but um, I have seizures. So I can't have a license. I... Um, but I've, I've always gotten to where I needed to be. You know, my girlfriend taught me, she goes, get your, get yourself on the bus and ding, ding when you need to stop. And I'm like, okay. But um, I humbled myself and I do take the bus and public transportation when needed. I, um, I depend on myself and only myself. Uh, I found myself uh, after my accident, here I go back, um, I remember my girlfriend at my mom's house, uh, she called, she wanted to bring over wine coolers and I was off my meds and talking and walking and my staying at my mom's, she was helping me with Brandon at the time who wasn't even two. My baby turned two when I was in the hospital. Um, but anyways, I remember her going, call your surgeon to see if you could drink. Okay, you know, um, and from there, it was, I was drinking, drinking over my scars. I mean, if you could imagine I was cut open, you know, emergency. So I feel like I have a tic-tac-toe board. I've um, felt ugly. I felt no one's gonna want me. 
And if my dad didn't, no one's for sure gonna want me now. Um, so the drink was on. And, you know, I was a good mom. I worked as needless to say, I got in the medical field for this parentonitis and I worked for a GI until my drinking got in the way. And I was very good at it and I loved it. And I love the medical field to this day. I learned something every time I go in. But um, I um, would just, I see I'm going with my train of thought. I um, would drink over it. And, you know, like I said, I was a pretty good mom. You know, we did baseball, his dinner was on the table, clothes washed, da, 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 everything. Fast forward to he's 16 and I'm 30 something. And um, I'm drinking like a freaking alcoholic. People with a man found me behind a parked car, passed out. I remember um, wanting to go back to the bar I was at the night before, you know, to get rid of the shakes and stuff. I'd go and they said, you can't come in from what you did last night. Have no idea. Don't want to know. Um, my boyfriend at the time, I tell him I'm having a party. He'd bring me handles of Southern Comfort Tequila, Jack, all my friends, all my guys. I like the guys, Jose, Jacks, and went south. But he... Um, would come back, he'd get him, bring him to me on that Sunday, come back on Friday and go, wow, must have been some party. And you guys, it was just me. And I know you guys could relate to that. Um, but with my son being um, old enough to see it and my niece and my nephew, they would come and see me passed out. My son seen me with other guys, just, you know, I was chasing the, I wanted to be wanted. I wanted to be strong and I wanted to feel like I was enough. But um, at this time, I, I didn't know how. I, I didn't know. And um, I like I got into an abusive relationship and then I went, my dad cheated on my mom and then I went with a guy for 16 years who cheated on me. That's who would buy me the handles. Anyways, he found, he, my niece took me to my first AA meeting in 2004. And these kids been through a lot, see me passed out naked, not to be, but you know, just the ugly and um, seeing me taking shots before work to get rid of the shakes, to um, thinking I was cool drinking with the kids, you know, it was just all bad. And like I said, from 33 to 43, I didn't have a sober day in my life, not one passed out for 10 years straight sick. I was sick of going to the hospital. I was sick of living. I, my, I felt like my son didn't like me. Nobody wanted me, you know, I'm gonna go eat a worm. Poor, poor me. But I, um, I, and I thought I was the one in A who wasn't gonna get that fifth chapter. And if some of you don't know what it is, it's like where you, that one of them doesn't get it. You know, you're just, and um, I was scared it was me because I couldn't get it. I couldn't get 24 hours. It was so freaking scary. If I got 12 hours and um, my boyfriend at the time, I'd beg for a half of a Xanax or a Xanax, which was prescribed to me because the shakes and the DTs were so bad. It was just, it was a, such a nightmare, but I'd do it again and do it again. So um, here I am. Fast forward to I um, to where we are today. I go to my endoscopies. I've learned through the program that I am worthy. I am enough. I uh, you guys love me. I love myself, but you guys, I didn't know that was the key to it of this whole freaking time. I did not know I was supposed to love myself. I was supposed to, you know, give me strength. I was supposed to, you know, give me the worthiness and everything. Um, my dad is not in my life today, but he did text me for my birthday, August 10th. And I texted him back. He said, happy birthday, Geraldine, I love you. Bam, that's all I needed. I text him back like a big girl. I love you too. And um, he has no idea what I go through. And my mom does it all. She's the grandpa, the dad, the mom. And 
we have a wonderful relationship today. Before, no one wanted me. No one. Everyone did the tough love. And I'm telling you, it was tough love. I was staying with my mom when I started getting into the program 2004. And I was working at Rite Aid at the time as a pharmacist assistant. And um, she's, and it was 10 to 12. I had to be work back from lunch. 12 or something and I said uh she goes you need to get out because she found Jack Daniels in the bathroom and I'm like what that's not mine you know the line stuff um and I go how long do I have she goes you have until 12 I'm thinking midnight so I had 10 minutes to get out and then it was on I um went to a hotel I had money from my malpractice I um thought I was cool and it was just that was my bottom. I was in a hotel acting like a whore, drinking like a, I don't know what, and thinking I was cool. No job, no family, just done. I call my um, boyfriend or whatever at the time, and um, there was a park across the street. He goes, pack up your shit, and I'll give you 20 minutes of my time. Um, to look around for a place because like I said I did have money from the malpractice so we did drive around and you guys I found this little house with one bedroom bathroom and a little it was like a little studio and the lady gave it to me on the spot and said Geraldine just change it over in your name the guests and all that Monday morning my boyfriend at the time threw me a pillow and a blanket and said good luck that's the best thing he could have done and you guys, there was an AA meeting two doors down. If God isn't in my plans, I don't know. And um, I would go, I would get sober, I'd relapse, I took dirty chips, I read drunk, I um, slept with guys, I at the Alano Club. It was just a disgusting way to do my sobriety, but I was still craving the attention. And um, Today, I, you know, and I always worried about how my son was going to turn out and stuff, but thank God, he, just thank God, and that's why I had the one, he turned out great, he's doing great in his life, I am doing good, I um, had a relapse, you know, over almost, two, almost two years ago, but, um, well, 19 months to be exact, going on 20. But um, it was a shot somebody gave me and I tried to drink like a lady and drink a um, lemon drop. The restaurant calls my mom and you know what? I could have went to jail, but thank God my mom is, they accept me in this program and she like knew it was my disease that kicked in that day. And, you know, I practiced a lot for you guys. I, uh, you know, I would try and every relapse, you guys, you want to know what it was? I stopped going to meetings. There was the key in all my relapses. So I thank God for these meetings. I thank God for you guys, because I um, I don't know where I'd be without you guys, because I know that I need meetings. This drunk needs meetings. I need the A. I need you guys. And, um, you know, I just... I feel I have strength today and I am worth it. I am myself and I am fearless. I don't um, care what people say about me anymore. That was huge. I don't, you know, I, I love me. And you guys, it's awesome. It's a good feeling. And with that, um, you know, I just want to say thanks to AA, thanks to Sobriety Engine. Thank you, Travis, for asking me. Like I said, we all have a story and it's like, what story do I tell? Because, you know, we're drunken fools. Can you imagine us in a bar telling our stories? Wow. But I love you all and thank you. And there it is. Thanks. Wow, that was incredible. A very powerful share. Uh, so raw, so truthful, so honest. Um, I, I mean, my pen was just going with all the correlations that I made. I mean, you 
you started right off, you know, with divorced parents at, at a young age, and immediately I felt myself, who do I want to do? Is it mom or is it dad? Who am I going to, you know, and, and I actually ended up going through joint custody, but that promoted a lot of instability in my life. Um, you know, you said your mom went into third shift. Shit, my mom was in school and a full-time job, and then she went to third shift, so I was pretty much all the, alone all the time. I didn't I mean, like, let's go. Um and then you, you know, like your story of um, not getting it at first or the second or third time, I too had a multiple relapse and I was just so, so disgusted with myself. And I, I was just like, why can't I stop drinking? I know I want to stop drinking, but I'm still doing these foolish decisions to, um, to, to keep my addiction alive to, to, and I'm, and I'm consciously, you know, like creating negative relationships and, and pissing people away. And, um, just, I can relate to your story on so many levels, Geraldine, and um, I'm so thankful that you that you're here to to share this, to you know, to exhibit your bravery and your vulnerability. And I know that there's so many people who are going to be able to hear your story and relate with you. Um, I, the, one of the things when you you at the end you said you relapsed because you left the meetings, and I too. I, I left meetings, I stopped going to meetings, I lost track of a healthy, positive community, I failed to communicate, and uh, this time I'm putting in a very diligent effort um, to, stay, to stay in the community. Um, and I, I attribute a lot of my success with this family that I've found in Sobriety Engine as well. So uh, you are definitely not alone, very worthy of your recovery, a very strong woman. Um, thank you so much for all that you had to share. Uh, like to open it up to the the rest of the group here to see if they have any uh, encouragement or questions or anything that they want to share with us today. Uh, go ahead and uh, raise your hand. Go ahead and spiel. I'm not going to stop you. All right, I'll go first. Um, that that was a that's you know once again, and I, I think I've said it before in the groups is, you know, every time someone tells their story, whether they're chairing the meeting or you know the speaker here or even when they go up to the front of an AA meeting um, when we were doing in-person meetings and they would speak I would always relate to some there was always a nugget in there that I could say oh that was me too you know that was that was me too and um I I've been extremely fortunate that you know I have a, a really good support network um I always have uh, you know the same people who would running, you know, back in the day and get me bottles or, you know, now the people saying no, no, you know, keeping me away from them. So um, it works, you know, um, it, it definitely works for me. I, I think, um, you know, I, when I, you know, I, I had my son when I was, when I was young, I have an adult son now. Um, and, um, you know, extremely well adjusted for, for all that's, you know, gone on in his life. Um, his mom left when he was really young. I was in the military at the time and um, she left. So it was really just me and him for a really long time um, until I met my, my husband now. So um, and I met him, you know, almost 20 years ago. So um, yeah, so uh, it's, it's been, um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's been a remarkable journey, but I can say that, um, you know, took me a long time to think I was, I mean, I, I didn't, I mean, no, first of all, no one goes to AA on their best day, right? That's, you don't walk in on your best day, right? You walk in because you, you know, you probably went through something traumatizing or bad. Well, I went because I was forced to go. I, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be, you know, every time in the very beginning, all I could think of was there's something wrong with these people. You know, they, they're, they're saying, you know, they're, they're saying they have a disease, they're saying they have problems, they're talking about, you know, living um, a very, you know, for lack of a better word, awkward slash, you know, degenerative lifestyle type things. And, and I just didn't see it, but that was me, you know, I, I was doing the same damn thing, you know, I was, you know, I, I was, I was literally approving things at work making decisions for my employer that could have harmed the employer and definitely harmed the employee just to get it off my desk so I could move on with my day and go get drunk. 
And it's horrible because a lot of those things I can't go back and make amends for. You know, they're, those things are done, buttoned up, and, and done. Um, uh, you know, the only thing I can do now is, you know, you know, make better decisions and, you know, walk in there and, and defend, you know, the people that I'm in, you know, that I've been charged with um, defending as their human resources director. So, um, and I try to do that. I try to do that to the best of my ability. Um, I can say that um, in sobriety, um, and it's been a short set, I only, I only have 16 months, so it's not like I got years and years of sobriety to talk about all these experiences, but even in that short time, um, every, you know, I shouldn't say everyone, many, many, many people at work, my colleagues have, have mentioned that I'm, you know, a lot more aware, you know, that, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're coming to me with, you know, hey, what, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing me as that source person again, that they can go to for, um, for advice, good, good, solid, you know, advice from a legal employment standpoint, advice, getting their way by calling me after 6 p.m. where I would say, I would just say yes to whatever you said, so you get the phone and leave me alone. Um, so I'm, I'm getting a lot of that back now. Another thing that I'm seeing is not just necessarily work, but some of those relationships that I had to let go when I was getting sober because it wasn't conducive to being sober. Um, the people I had to let out of my life, um, I, I'm getting some of that back now. Um, you know, in the last three months, I've had two people reach out to me that I kind of had to let go in the beginning of sobriety. Um, and just say, hey, you know, this, if I meet this person out in town, this is not going to go well for me. And um, so that's nice. You know, I'm getting some of that back. And, you know, I, I think about the promises when I think about those connections that I had to let go in the beginning and them coming back. The ones that are meant to come back will come back. And, and those that didn't. But, you know, getting sober is a very, you know, we have the community, but it's a very solo affair because everything you knew, first of all, my coping mechanism, I'm sure everyone can relate. My coping me mechanism was alcohol. If I had a good day, I celebrated with alcohol. If I had a shitty day, I drank away my, you know, my, my failure with, you know, drinking, you know, so, it, you know, it was, it was my coping mechanism. And if those, if those are your triggers, doing really good or doing really bad, you can almost always find a reason to drink, right? Because you either had a good day or a bad day, right? You, it just is, you know, so you can, so that was me. And um, yeah, it, it's a solo affair. You, you, you really find yourself, you're new to the rooms, so you don't know who to reach out to per se. You get a phone list, like you, sh you, when you show up to A, you get this nice phone list and they're like, hey, here's, here's a men's phone list, you know, good luck. And you're like, I don't know any of these people. I don't know what they're going to say. I'm not calling these people. And, and you know, luckily for me, um, I stumbled. It was a, this, and this is, this is, it, when you were saying in your story how, you know, the, the home where the boyfriend kind of threw them, the pillow and the sheet and the blanket thing down and said, hey, and, and, and you was at a meeting two doors away. And that was definitely, you know, a higher power at work in that, in setting that up. Um, the same thing for me. Um, when I got to my, I got the strength to crawl into rehab, you know, my first AA meeting, I met my sponsor who happened to be an, a graduate of the same rehab program that I was currently in at the time and had the same advisor, the counselor advisor at that rehab, which was our connection, which made him my, which was why he said yes to being my sponsor. He wasn't taking sponsees at the time. And, um, and he, I know he really wants to step back. So he wants us to go out and find, it just hasn't, I just haven't done it yet. I, I do need to start looking, but that will happen in time. But, um, you know, I don't think that that was by mistake. I think I was meant to be at that, at that meeting and run into him. And he had that same background. So that was nice. And then um, I, I was, a, it was my third, it was my third weekend sober. I went to an As Bill Sees It AA meeting in Milpitas. And the reason I went was my friends were all at Chili's down the way in Morgan Hill, about 10 miles south of where I live um, in San Jose. They, they were like, hey, come on out. We'll just make sure you only have one, right? Your friends are going to 
my the friends who you know you've been getting drunk with for years and years are now going to monitor your drinking and make sure you don't yeah right but I had made a deal with God and I don't know why I think I'm on the level that I can make deals with God, but I did. I made a deal with God and I said, I'm going to go to this meeting. And when this meeting's over, if I still want to get drunk, I'm going to go. And I went to that as Bill sees the meeting. And it was a Sunday at um, 5 p.m. meeting in Milpitas, California. And um, I went in, I sat down, the meeting started. And it was my first time with this group, which would eventually become my home group. And I um, I sat there and about 30 minutes into the meeting, some a gentleman shared and he talked about his relapse story and how his very first relapse, he wrecked his car, permanently damaged his health. You know, um, it was the reason his wife left him and all this stuff. And I'm like, holy shit, I can't do any more damage. I remember leaving that meeting right after the prayer at the end, throwing my phone down in the passenger seat and driving away and being, I'm not going to Chile. Like, God, there's no way, these people are crazy. And I, and I didn't mess with my phone the rest of the night. I just went home and opened the big book and started doing step work, right? So um, I believe that was some, some higher power at work. You know, I needed to hear that message. I needed that story to be told and they needed to understand the destruction that would occur in my life, the damage that would be done if I made the decision to go to the bar that night. Um, you know, all the work I had done up to that point, even though, you know, just three weeks into AA um, and about, you know, a month into sobriety, um, I, you know, I was making a deal with God because, you know, I'm powerful enough to do that in my head, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's it's what happened. And, and I believe that. So I do believe we get put in the right place at the right time if we're, if our eyes are open and our ears are open to the right thing. And, and that really worked out for me. So, um yeah, it allowed me to, to, to weave that time together. And I'm always talking about, you know, sewing time together because for me, you know, that's what it's about. You know, it, it is one day at a time. And Leo, you're absolutely right. We all have the same 24 hours, but it is a, it's, it's the long game, right? We're doing the long game 24 hours at a time. And you're right. I mean, if you start thinking about, you take your eye off the ball of today, of waking up sober, doing your prayer or meditation or journaling, whatever it is you do in the morning and then staying sober that day, you will probably lose it. You, if you're just thinking, if all you think about is the long game, you'll lose it, probably. Um, but it is the long game played 24 hours at a time. And, and that's how I look at it. And it, it, you know, I think, I thank my God, I thank my support group, I thank my home group, my counselors, my psychiatrists. You know, I'm, I'm super blessed to have that kind of structure in my life where, you know, I, I you know, I just have a great insurance company that would much rather pay for me to have therapy than a bunch of ER visits, right? So I'm, I'm super blessed. Not everybody has that. And I'm, I'm, I'm painstakingly aware of that. So, um, yeah, so uh, there's a lot there. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I guess that's, uh, that's all I got. And I'm just rambling now. So small groups, I guess I get away with it. I'll get a pass this time, Travis. Thank you. I won't do it again. Um, thank you all. All right. Thanks. I'm, I'm good. Uh, <clears throat> looks like uh, Travis might have jumped out there. Hey, I think he's having internet problems because it's not the first time we lost him too. <clears throat> um, Omar helped uh, to unpack me about a month ago and be able to say that I love myself. And that took so long. That took so long. So um, one of the things I've been doing lately is to say, I love you. And I love you, uh, Jerry, because you never know the next time you're going to see somebody or if you ever see him again. So uh, thank you for your share. It was uh, incredibly personal and a ton of pain. And uh, uh, one of my, well, one of my favorite songs now, one of my drinking songs was from you uh, 2 still haven't found what I'm looking for. Cause I've, I, I've been in a relationship for so long and I remember just drinking my fucking head off and putting it on and listening to it and just pounding. And, you know, now it's one of my favorite songs cause I think I found what I'm looking for. And that's in these rooms and there's balance in these rooms. But there's also balance in myself right now that I wouldn't have been able to get to without a support team. 
you know, not just to ride the engine, but, you know, uh, uh, my psychiatrist, my psychologist, and I don't have 500 friends. I don't get involved. I don't, I don't have that. I, I'm, I, am I a lone wolf? Probably some of us are meant to be that. But when you're by yourself and you're sober, you have a long time to think about stuff now, clear, clear, you know, and uh, there are uh, a few folks that if I had a circle would be in my circle, you know, the people in this room would be in my circle because you're not a threat to me. You get me. We understand each other and we all. Okay, I like that. That's huge trust, you know, that's huge trust. And, you know, your story is, it, it's, it's one of loneliness. I can fucking relate. It's one of self-hate. I can fucking relate. You know, it's one of, of uh, my booze never lied to me. Every time I drank it, it never lied to me. Reality is it always did, but it never lied to me while I was using, you know. Uh, and I didn't need a trigger. I didn't need it to justify it, nothing. As soon as I opened my eyes, I had to feed. That's it. That's it, you know. Uh, um, your story speaks to a lot of folks and I hope a lot of folks watch your share today because it was uh, powerful, truthful, vulnerable. You know, uh, um, most of us that hang in these rooms, we got a problem at least one, we got a problem, you know? We don't have all the answers, we don't have all the solutions, but we got common ground that if we don't drink or use pills or whatever, that's a good start. If we can find, you know, a way to love ourselves, that's a good start. If I can find a way to love somebody else, that's a good start, you know? If, if I can listen to your pain so I can help deal with mine, that's a good start. If I can help somebody unpack their stuff to help mine stay not packed, that's a damn good start, you know? And um, I just, I want to thank you for your, your, your vulnerability, your share, your trust, the honor, the honor of listening to you today. Thank you for giving me that gift. Yeah, um, I definitely think that what you what you shared today, Geraldine, is uh, very much a gift and very much beautiful. Um, it seems like a lot of us here seem to be um, yeah. I think he's in a bad internet spot. I hope he's back. I wish my internet would work effectively on a Saturday morning. It works great six days of the week. And then on Saturdays, it's just like, I don't want to work. Um, which is, you know, it's a little bit ironic because I guess if, uh, you know, we've been talking about this, we take six days on and one day off, we are uh, prone to um, opening up some doors of our disease. Um, and, uh, you know, what Chris was talking about was like this 24 hours at a time. Forever. And, you know, that kind of drilled home to me is like day in and day out. Like, I can't really take a day off in my recovery, but I might be able to take a day off in my job. You know, I have to be able to differentiate the differences that I live with this dysfunctional thinking. Um, and until I address that thinking pattern, nothing is really going to change. And so... I've been without alcohol now for what, seven months, um, drugs equally as long, if not longer. And uh, I still find myself with these dysfunctional, these dysfunctional thinking patterns, which means that I myself still have to dig deeper that this, this work is not yet done. It will not be done until I stop breathing. Um, you know, and I'm grateful that I get to have these experiences. I'm grateful that I get to sit here every single Saturday with my shitty internet connection and share a, a great, connection with all of you guys um it, it's 
you guys connect better to me than my internet connects with my laptop and that's important to me and uh, i hear all of you guys and i love that i can come here and be completely vulnerable with um you know you guys used to be strangers but you guys are becoming very much my family and friends and that's just such an incredible power to me that's my you know one of my higher powers my spirituality has blessed me with people who love and understand me for once in my life or so i've allowed them to come in you know i've opened up some doors and allowed people to come into my life i've i've um brene brown talks about being vulnerable and she uses um one of her analogies is like you know being a gladiator in the stage and, and you know sometimes we gotta we gotta fight the lions and the beast in the stage and, ha and get dirty and sweaty and bloody and bruised and battered and stuff but that's the reality of what you know living life as an addict is um we have to dodge a lot of tough obstacles but if we don't we will get eaten alive and you know what are the consequences of that I lose positive relationships. I lose my community. I lose my self-worth. I lose my strength. You know, I lose my cognitive thinking skills and my love and my caring, my understanding. And the list goes on forever of all the positives that I have and how many times I was willing to sacrifice the negatives, sorry, risk the positives to, to consume a negative substance. And it, uh, it's just a brutal way of living a life. And when, you know, when, when we share these stories, we, we find parallels that maybe I might not have been known to before, you know, um, how many other people out there had divorced parents and instability and did not, or still are not aware that that is influencing their thinking patterns. They might not be an addict, but they might have other character defects, um, you know, that, that, that they're not correlating with, with our stories. And I think that us as addicts have, have a unique power to be able to spread a message um, and connect with people who struggle with just mental illness and, and insecurities. And, um, you know, you mentioned about drinking away like PTSD and living and, and uh, like traumas and stuff. And um, I, I have some pretty substantial PTSD in my life. And for a while, you know, like Chris said, I have a good or a bad, I have the perfect trigger to drink because my day is going to be good or bad. Like, I'm not going to get around that. I don't need triggers when it's just good or bad. Like, and so when I make my life, so I have two feelings in life. It's either a good day or a bad day. I'm not feeling anything else until that alcohol passes my lips and, and starts working through my bloodstream. Now I'm starting to feel the buzz and now I'm okay to, you know, dilute the feelings that I'm supposed to be feeling as a human. And um, that's kind of just a, a scary way of living life to me. Um, and, and, you know, I lacked, I lacked a lot of awareness in my life. I put myself into poor environments with poor people who, who were, you know, Geraldine and, and Chris talked about, you know, the peers who come on, let's just have one drink fuck that. I'm going to have five drinks. You're my drinking buddies. You know, I'm, there's no such thing as control here. Like we are drinking buddies. And until you guys are, are fully supportive of the fact that I'm admitting I have something wrong with me, so you guys can come around and show me some love and understanding and, and some true friendship. And I can't have you guys in my life because right now I'm tired of dealing with all these character defects with the bottle of alcohol or drugs. And right now I'm setting the side time aside diligently every day to, to make sure that I can achieve everything that I want to achieve. And within that, you know, we circle back to exactly, you know, what it takes to be, you know, in, in recovery and it takes strength and, and every single day. And we have to be reminded of our worthiness and, and from ourselves and from the people in a community like this, you know, like I can tell myself, I love myself. And then I can also say that I love Geraldine and Chris and Leo, you know, you guys all came here and we are all, all supporting each other today. And, um, when it was just as alcohol, man, I love you was just three words with, you know, and, and a couple more letters than that. It had no way, there was no meaning to my life. And um, today I take significance in the fact that I can be an honest person and I, and I can share myself like this. Um, you know, there's, this is just such a great meeting and such a great opportunity. And I, you know, thank you again, Geraldine, for um, allowing us to have such a great, a great intimate, discussion this morning um is there anything that you would like to share with us um we still got quite a few minutes left 
Um, you know, I just want to thank you all for listening to me and um, because I feel like there's no judgment here. I don't know if I was recklessly honest, but you know what? That's a part of my story and I'm not, a, I hope I didn't offend anybody, but I, um, that's just how I elaborate, <laughs> you know, I, but um, sometimes I speak too much, but uh, it's my story and you know, I, there's no getting around it. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it and dress it all up all pretty and pink. But I, um, I really, you know, I was not comfortable yesterday thinking about what I had to say if I had to say anything. My stinking thinking started getting to me going, what are you, you don't have nothing to say. What, damn it, Geraldine, you're, str you're strong and you're worthy. You do have something to say, damn it. So I didn't even think about it, you know, just what comes from your heart when the, the freaking you press record is I vomit the truth. And that is what this alcoholic didn't do in, before 2004. I was the best liar, so I thought. But I love you guys and I thank you so much. Thank you, Travis. I could listen to you all day. You are an old soul. You are you are awesome. I love that you have these meetings. I love to see you in meetings and I love what you have to share. Thank you so much. Thank you, Geraldine. And uh, you, you touched on a great point right there. Uh, one of the reasons I do like to record these is uh, I think there is a substantial amount of therapeutic benefits, uh, not only for yourself or myself or the members in this group, but I mean, we can come back years from now and listen to this and still find correlation to it. Uh, and, you know, it, it is your story. And for anyone who has shared or is willing to share afterwards, it, it's, this is a pretty raw meeting and uh, whatever you have to say to, to get the pus out and the poison away, like, feel free to share it to you. I'm not gonna, um, you know, that's one of the reasons I asked to hold this space was uh, we just have to heal. And I think that this provides us a unique therapeutic benefit um, and we have the technology of, you know, Zoom to be able to record these meetings for us to go back and, and analyze. And uh, it, it's just, it's a cool, a cool platform. It, it's, it's a cool technology and um, so grateful for everything that's really occurred here. Leo or Chris, you guys got any last minutes, words of wisdom before we close out and enjoy our wonderful Saturdays? One of the things, um, sorry, Chris, I'm going to go ahead if that's okay. One of the things that I found is um, with us in this room in particular, we're so far, we're vulnerable as hell in here. We're laying it out for everybody. This is as raw and as honest with you as I can be, you know, and we've all kind of done that. And there's such, uh, there's such strength for me, at least that we can tell other people's stories. Because once sobriety engine, once, once the people that belong start to say this, start to watch us, start to hear us tell their stories for them, it's gonna make it easier for them to tell, them story, to tell their stories. It's gonna make it easier for them to get over that, over those hurdles that we have. And uh, trust is so amazing with what I found with Sobriety Engine. And you, my friend, this is your wheelhouse. Do not let this go. This is your wheelhouse. And you got a chance to help so many people. You know what? And uh, don't take that away from everybody. This is your strength. This is your wheelhouse. It's an honor to know you. And I love you, my brother. Thank you, Leo, so much. You've done so much for me and this platform. I know you have. You, Your heart is fucking bigger than this earth. I don't know how, I don't know how that's possible, but, but you are an incredible, incredible soul, my friend, and thank you for your, your wisdom. All right, everyone. Um, thank you for sharing your time with me today. Um, Again, great story, Geraldine. Thanks for the support, Chris, Leo, uh, myself. Uh, if you're watching this video later, I uh, hope you guys get out what you need from this. And I uh, look forward to um, continuing to run these meetings. For those of us who weren't here today, uh, those of us who are still struggling, 
those of us who are still seeking answers, uh, we'll take a moment of silence for you and we will close out with the serenity prayer. God, God, grant me the serenity to accept, to accept things the things I cannot change, the courage to change, change the things I can, and the wisdom, the wisdom to, to know the difference. Just for today. Just for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, Sobriety Engine. Uh, have a great day, everyone. I love you guys. Thanks, Travis. Thanks, Leo. Thank you, Travis. Bye, Geraldine. Love you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Leo, love you guys.